Signore e signori, buonasera, welcome to Casa Italiana at Zerilli Marimo at New York University. My name is Stefano Albertini, I'm the director of the Casa, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here tonight for a journey of discovery. And uh, as you know, we'll be discussing um, a book and a documentary by and about Gabriella Belloni. Um, you see the cover of the book there. I invite you to log in. Normally, people tell you to turn off your cell phones. I tell you to turn them on and let people know that you're here and you're hearing uh, Alice, um, Gabriella talk about uh, her journey to America. Uh, I don't want to take away more time because I, I have the privilege of discussing with Gabriella at the end of the documentary. And I think now it's a beautiful introduction uh, to what we're going to discuss uh, tonight. So enjoy the documentary, and sh immediately after, we're going to start the discussion of the book. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, um, watching uh, my life uh, with you. Um, it made, made me feel very emotional, but also very proud uh, of myself. <laughs> <laughs> as, you, as you should be. Yeah, I as agree. you should be. I agree. Well, thank you very much for writing this book. Thank you. And you kept me company in these last few days. Uh, your story, and I deliberately decided to spend my Columbus Day <laughs> not reading about Columbus, but by reading about your journey. Thank you, thank you. To the new so world. nice. And uh, uh, <laughs> first of all, it's a book that it's all out. Uh, it's mm. there is no reticence. Mm -hmm. There is no. I would like to say this, but I'm not saying it. It's you tell it as you lived it, and you make the reader become part of your story. Yeah. And I think, of course, this resonates more with us New Yorker for the first part of the book, in which you par talk about New York in 1970. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this very neighborhood. Yeah. Your first home in New York was here on 9th Street, between 5th right. and 6th, so exactly three blocks from here. Mm -hmm. And you studied at NYU Film School, yes. as you mentioned. So yeah. other few right blocks here. from here. <laughs> and, um, so, but I would like to, and the documentary is largely based on the book, so the storyline is what Gabriella told in, in her book mm -hmm. that was used as a sort of a storyboard for the documentary right, itself. Right, exactly. Um, so with your decision of, of leaving Italy, it's, it's clearly expressed in, in the documentary, but I would like to go with you to the root of it, and of course the relationship with your father that you mentioned very mm -hmm. clearly, but also in, in a larger way with the sort of patriarchal, uh, structure of society that was very clearly exemplified by that employer that told you you can just uh, marry, have a husband, be happy with the little job that you have, and maybe retire in 40 years with the gold watch. You don't have the gold Not watch. Not never. <laughs> any I refuse to have Any gold regret watch. about that? No, I, I never regret it. Um, even when I was very uh, poor in New York, because I didn't really, I couldn't work, I didn't have a job, I was lucky enough to have met this beautiful Jewish family who kind of adopted me for the first uh, six months, and that's when I lived on 9th Street, because I couldn't afford 9th <laughs> Street between 5th and 6th. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but then, um, so even then, even after the, the rape, uh, I never, never thought of going back. I was just, as, this is my life, it's, it's, it's difficult, I know it, but that's why I came here, not to be safe, to explore, to find out who I really am, what I can do, and how far I can take it. <laughs> and Gabriel, one aspect also that interested me is that you had definitely the myth of America. Oh, yeah. That one-way ticket says it all. <laughs> you really were not planning to go back. No. And at first, 
period of time you really barely corresponded even with your with your mother that you yeah. loved very much. And when you started corresponding with her, you would give her a very sweetened up version of what your life was here. Um, but also in America, when, when you arrive here, you are confronted with a reality that is very different from what you imagined, expected, and hoped for. You, you confronted a uh, racial divide, a very deep racial divide, mm -hmm. even in good people, in people that you respected and yeah, you loved. And even you, you still saw racial prejudice. And you also saw that the gender gap was not maybe better here than it was in Italy. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you arrived here and you saw that part of your myth was very different from the reality that you confronted every day? Uh, well, that was part of the plan, to deal with it um, uh, in the best way I could, meaning I accepted it and explored it. Um, I wasn't, um, I never had really a negative uh, attitude towards it because there are so many cultures, uh, so many different way of uh, lifestyles and way of thinking that I was very open to it. So um, I, I took it in and um, it made also that being in, in contact with all these different uh, cultures, uh, it may it opened my mind, and that's all why I, I thank America for that. It made me grow younger. You grow younger when you're in America. <laughs> you don't grow old. <laughs> and, and among all these groups and these different races that you sort of deliberately wanted to get to know people that were different from you. And you said that in the first period of time, you ran away from Italians as fast as you could. Yeah. You didn't want to hang out with the Italians. <laughs> uh, but at some point, it seems that the natural choice for a young Italian woman in New York is to make some money to be a waitress in a, yeah. uh, in, a, in, it, in Italian uh, American Italian American coffee shop, Café Reggio, uh, like Café again, a few blocks from here. Cappuccino. What was your experience dealing with Italian Americans? What were well, what um, was your reaction? What was your reaction towards <laughs> you? And um, without offending anybody, um, it uh -oh. wasn't. Uh oh. <laughs> 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 um, I. Um, that, I, that didn't feel very attractive to me because um, they felt they were really stuck in a time warp, you know, thinking of an Italy that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so I could not uh, perform the way they wanted me probably to perform. I was the ragazza italiana, uh, I was supposed to be able to cook. Um, uh, get a, a boyfriend, an Italian boyfriend, uh, have a family. Um, but uh, that, uh, when I found out that that was suffocating, so I didn't, that job didn't last that long. <laughs> I uh, rather, uh, I choose to be a waitress as in Max's Kansas City, which was <laughs> uh, rock and roll, was wild. Uh, um, and thank, uh, thanks to a, the, the grill man, the work there was a, 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 an African-American guy with a big heart. I loved him because he saw that I wasn't making any money with tips. I was slow. <laughs> <laughs> so he will uh, keep the um, steaks in the refrigerator and, and give them to me. And then he hired me to be his, uh, photo, his assistant in, uh, taking Polaroid pictures in Harlem nightclubs. Tell us something about that job. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, amazing. To me, going to Harlem as a white woman was like, wow, great, I'm doing it. <laughs> Otherwise, it was impossible. You know? And what did you do in this, in this job? Uh, so I, mm, he, um, he took Polaroid pictures on weekends in uh, different uh, nightclubs in Harlem. An amazing scene, uh, great music, lots of um, you know pimps and their girls, uh, and obviously I was naive and you know looked how different, and um, uh, I would make a percentage of the um, of the photo, the Polaroids that I was taking, which wasn't much. <laughs> so the the guys with um, the the pimps uh, were <laughs> come to me and say, you know, why you're not making enough money? You should work. I'll set you up. You can have your own apartment. 
and a refrigerator, and even a TV set. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the grill man, um, whose name was actually, I, I named him Prince because he was a prince, but his real n nickname was Big Black. <laughs> they all knew him as Big Black. He, he told me to not to talk to these people, say, me no speak English. <laughs> <laughs> You just to take the shot, get the money, and come to me. <laughs> and but then the, the Italian Americans come back to your life because it's thanks to them that you get a job in a radio. Oh yeah, the Italian American radio. I was uh, selling tomato sauce, <laughs> um, <laughs> pasta, and uh, and playing uh, Osole Mio and Volare on the radio. <laughs> And that you gotta do what you got, you know. You've gotta make some money somehow. And that brings <laughs> us to my next question: that it, it's a book that comes with the soundtrack. Yeah. You, you don't have a CD because you probably would need ten CDs, because <laughs> there is a soundtrack that accompanies you while you read the you, book, you and you hear it in your in your mind while you read it. So of course there are your Jimi Hendrix and uh, Morrison. Morrison. Yeah. And and then jazz and then and, the jazz, and then yes. the Italian music that you sort of like <laughs> and don't like, uh, <laughs> but you have to deal with it yeah. anyway. Um, <laughs> so and and I love the idea that when you finally take your car and decide to drive across the country, mm -hmm. you're stuck with country music <laughs> and you're desperately looking for <laughs> a station Dennis Joplin, that will play the, the who, American music that you had, <laughs> and there is no radio no. to play any of that. <laughs> so uh, tell us something about the, the, the soundtrack of your stories and how music uh, is important for uh, you. This is a great uh, theme for me because I couldn't live in a country where I had no soundtrack. I mean, Italy, it's not my soundtrack. Um, even though I love Bolare, and the, but um, it, it has nothing to do with the music I love. I grew up with uh, Elvis, and uh, it's, uh, since then I was gone. I was an American. <laughs> I love the blues. <laughs> uh, and when Morrison uh, told me to follow the, your mu follow the music, follow your dreams, baby, I, a month later I was... Uh, in Manhattan, the music is very important to me. It's my soul, and you have to have a soul. And in Italy, I don't, I, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to talk badly about Italy, but that, that's not music, there's Gabriela, something else. What, and what kind of music do you listen to right now? Um, if I can, um, the, well, uh, the Stones always, uh, but some jazz, uh, blues always. Uh, Fleetwood Mac, I mean, they bring me back to my fun times. Um, I listen to American and English music. Um, yeah, as I said, music is very important. It's in my life. And the, for the job I do, uh, promoting Italian television shows, I always put some blues and rock and <laughs> as a score, you know, even if it doesn't belong to the show, I, I just do it. <laughs> Gabriella's present job, she's a, a director for television, and she works on promotion of Italian uh, national television programs. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we read uh, huh? something from your book? Oh. And maybe we'll skip the part where you leave Italy, and we uh, oh. go to the moment in which you arrive in New York. So we'll oh. hear it in your own voice. It's the translation uh, in English. The book so far is only available in Italian. No, it's available. It's, it's only in, in English. On in, in English, it's on, Am uh, on Amazon. Um, the title is My American Dream. My American Dream. Yeah, my American dream, and it's on Amazon. So um, I'll um, I'll skip. Uh, what? Do <laughs> Sorry. We go to your arrival in New York. Okay, my arrival in New York. Sorry. Um, New York City. Okay. Oops. This happen, okay. Okay. It's okay. All right. October first, nineteen seventy. Today, by the way, uh, would be um, it's John Lennon's birthday. It would have been 78. <laughs> October 1st, 1970. While my plane lands at JFK Airport on the opposite side of the country, the young body of Jimi Hendrix made it back to his hometown, Seattle. As his life ends, mine begins. Overwhelmed by the change in my life, 
my harrowing state of mind is replaced by a youthful curiosity and a new adolescent. Okay. I feel 15 for the first time. With faded bell-bottom uh, jeans and a large parka, I blend with the fast-paced Manhattan crowd as if magically I have no history. I have left the suffocating past behind, a past I have nothing to do with because I am now and I live in the present. And it is the present that gives me tears of emotion while crossing the Brooklyn Bridge for the first time, staring at the arresting side of Wall Street in a cold afternoon light, the reflection um, of, sorry guys, of a pale winter sun making the skyscrapers shimmer like precious jewels. The Twin Towers are being built and grow taller by the day, dwarfed by not humbled by the gigantic structure surrounding me. I let my cleansing tears flow down my face. There is a sea of conflicting emotions in me. It's bigger than I ever thought, incomparable to anything I know but it won't stop me from dreaming. I will have no fear, because I will be part of it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, thank you. And Gabriel, while, while I was reading it, I know that you originally wrote it in Italian, yeah. but it has the essential features of American prose, uh, the way in which you write. And I was wondering whether you... That's a great compliment. <laughs> no, because we are used it as Italians, and of course as people who study Italian I, literature, been my goal. have lots of subordination and long convoluted mm -hmm. sentences. And for a long time we were taught in Italy that good writing was like that. Complicated Baroque with a lot of uh, subordinates and a oh. sentence within the other. And of course the great lesson of contemporary American literature is quite the opposite. It's this sort of very uh, essential style mm -hmm. that can be very elegant, for example, in the choice of words, the way in which you describe things, but definitely reminded me of American prose. So my first question is that, who are the American authors that influenced you the most? Hemingway. <laughs> <laughs> Father Hemingway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, who translated the, the book into English? Me. You translated it. Oh, yeah. I because did it my all. My question was, <laughs> it must have been rather easy to translate it into English because it comes from a prose that is very, very uh, similar to the uh, great English prose of, of American literature. In particular. Well, actually, the story goes that um, I took a year off when I was in LA and wrote the book in English. Uh. Yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, it took me a year and the title was Avenue of the Americans. <laughs> and uh, then I went to Italy, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, he knew my story, and he said, uh, there is a, a young uh, publishing house, they want something like diario minimo, like a diary. Um, I translated the first 50 pages in into Italian, and they loved it, and they published uh, the book, Il Sentiero Americano. Then I wrote it back into English. <laughs> that explains a lot of things <laughs> that I didn't know, but it all makes yeah. sense. Yeah, right. It all makes sense. Uh, you talked about Max's Kansas City. So that was your first really encounter with America because you were in a sort of sheltered mm -hmm. uh, home in, on 9th Street, this very nice family Beautiful. that took you in. Yeah. They were very hospitable, very nice. And then the job at Cafe Reggio that didn't last long, we know. <laughs> and so Max's Kansas City was real, your first impact with America. And with the America you dreamed of, these great uh, musicians and mm -hmm. the fast pace and uh, mm -hmm. all the different people in different races working different jobs. So what was it like for you to find yourself in that reality? But maybe we should yeah. hear it from... Yeah, right, I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, Hold on just a second. Okay, Max is Kansas City. Um, so okay. Where was it exactly? Uh, uh, Gramercy Park, 17th Street. 
I w um, in, which is a beautiful place. I think it still must be the same, just a paradise. Uh, and, and this was total madness. <laughs> um, the owner uh, was a wild guy, but he um, he took me he took me in, um, and uh, so it was my my first uh, um, the impact was really strong. Uh, I had no idea what was going on, but I had to learn very fast. <laughs> so I work in Max's Kansas City on 17th Street and Gramercy Park. Gramercy Park is like an oasis bordering with the weirdness of Chelsea and the wildness of 14th Street. Um, it was like that, it was really wild. Um, I work the lunch shift and my hours are 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. To make ends meet at night, I work as Princess the African-American Grillman assistant, taking snapshots with a Polaroid camera in various Harlem nightclubs. The whole atmosphere is so surreal that it seems as if I have entered a forbidden realm. I am the only white girl, and my Italian accent attracts more customers. Um, this is Harlem. I smile and say something like, want me to take a picture? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the customers are so gaudy uh, the, that the color the color prints speed out of the camera with a sparkle. I've learned that the gaudiest patrons are called pimps. Another word I did not know the meaning of. A pimp is the lowest of human race, the scum of the earth. Prince is proud of me. She took pictures of Jimi Hendrix. This gal is an artist, he says, and warns me, uh, and warns me against those jeweled loaded types. Just shoot the shot and get the money. If they ask you any question, say, me, no English, and come to me. So every time one of the pimps wants to know my name, where I live, and how much I'm making, I say, me, no English. They answer with a grin, and then ask why I'm not working for them people instead. Make a lot more though, and no expenses, in including rent. But uh, I follow Prince's rules. No booze, no drugs, no fucking, at least none in Harlem nightclubs. <laughs> These are very sound principles. <laughs> <laughs> the book is a lot of fun. I mean, it, there are many pages that make you cry, and you saw some of them, and there are many pages that are really full of spirit, and it's like Thank you. indomitable. And it's like all over the place. And another question from the point of view of a New Yorker who arrived here uh, about 25 years after you mm -hmm. arrived. And what is it for you when you come back to New York now and you walk in the Lower East Side where you lived and you mm -hmm. walk in, uh, around Washington Square that mm -hmm. was like nobody's land at a certain yeah. point. Um, what is it like for you to come back to New York now and see the, these transformations that happened from 1970? I think. May I say that it was more fun then? <laughs> it, was, it was a lot more dangerous, but boy, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've been here uh, um, only a few days and stay with my sister. Um, she lives in a quiet place. Um, and um, I, when I see the streets of Manhattan, all the, you know, the traffic and the people, um, I, I'm glad I lived uh, that you know that uh, time in despite all that happened. in spite of all of that oh boy yes As absolutely i'm glad i'm lucky <laughs> je ne regrette rien no rien <laughs> rien de rien <laughs> and since you mentioned alessandra of course uh, gabriella is the sister of alessandra belloni that many of you know please alessandra take a stand and take Thank a bow <laughs> for the few the few of you that don't know Alessandra, I would say she's the most precious gift that you left to New York. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, Alessandra, right. yeah. and Alessandra is a performer, a scholar, a healer. Uh, we have the fortune to be able to count on her presence on this very stage at least once a year. And she, every time she comes back with uh, a different performance that is the result of very, very 
deep study and, and exercise and practice, and we are very grateful for what she does uh, to promote a real knowledge of traditional Italian folklore culture, not based on preconceptions, but based mm -hmm. on, on real study. But since this is an homage to Alessandra, we want to know how she got here. Why don't you tell us? Oh, <laughs> OK. Um, uh, let's say, uh, sorry. Uh, OK. It's the month of August, a hot and humid summer, and my whole family show, show up. My mother, my sister, my brother, and his girlfriend. I was informed of their arrival by a letter. By the time it got to me from Italy, they were already up in the air on a 747, <laughs> Italian mail. <laughs> it never fails you, I mean, it, it always fails you. It's too late to modify my meager look of my, the meager look of my apartment, the smell of fried eggs and dog piss permeating, permeating the building hallway, the walls faded paint, the tenant's shabby appearance. I can't hide the bumps on the empty lot, the tall man with a broken neck, I think his name is, was Paul, and most of all, I can't hide my lifestyle. I knew my mother would have, ha would have had a problem with me going from a secure job, a career as a photojournalist, to waiting table in Max's Kansas City and take snapshots of Harlem pimps and their hookers. Um, gotta tell your mother what you do, said Prince. It ain't nothing to be ashamed of. All you do is trying to make an honest living. He's right. But how am I going to explain to my mother my fascination with the outcasts? My decision to leave Sarah's protected world for the thrills of living on the edge and the immediate gratification I'm experience, experiencing from the absence of fear in my actions there's no time for me to come up with an explanation. I do not have myself. Whatever happens, I'm not going to let my family interfere with my choices. For there is no reason why my life in New York turned out to be this way. It just is. The feat begins when my family arrives on a Sunday afternoon. It's hot and the humidity is high. I'm nervous about seeing my mother, a mother I have left without saying goodbye. I'm nervous showing her where I live. And I worry what my scant living oops, sorry, conditions could preoccup preoccupy her even more than she needs to be. To embellish my adobe, abode, I bought flowers and distributed them wherever the wall had a crack or, <laughs> or a hole by taping the stem over the break. I then covered the tub with plywood and laid over it uh, an exotic piece of cloth I found at a thrift shop. Summer of si seven, 1971, uh, JFK, New York. Here they come. My mother has tears in her eyes, and so do I. Luckily, the excitement is going to take over the mushy stuff. For the moment we meet at the gate, we all begin to talk all at once, as usual. Distance and time has no made us strangers, and we generate more energy than the rest of the crowd here. There are many questions and almost no answers. As long as I can remember, no one in our family was ever able to finish a conversation because someone else would jump in, would jump right in in the middle of it. <laughs> there are gasps of wonder followed by chuckles and laughter. To pick up my family, I have borrowed Buddy's beat-up station wagon, which, in spite of its age and injuries, impresses my mother for its, its size and smoothness. It feels like being on a boat, she says <laughs> euphorically. There are four of them and twice as many bags. They all fit in, bodies and luggage. My mother is the most exciting. This is America, the promised land, a land where everything is bigger, including its people. <laughs> when the excitement for the first, uh, or the first impact settles in, I begin to examine my family. My brother has grown a beard, which together with his long hair makes him resemble the late Jim Morrison. My teenage sister's volcanic personality has just started to bloom. <laughs> A Hindu symbol painted on her forehead, 
Alessandra is carrying a small pouch containing a pipe and tobacco. To see a 17-year-old girl smoking a pipe was <laughs> controversial even in the 70s. <laughs> Equipped with her usual sense of humor and vivacious energy, my mother seems more at ease with herself. Eliminating the presence of an abusive husband had been a matter of life or death. I can see it in her eyes. There is a joy and a glow I had forgotten she ever had. Beautiful. <laughs> and Gabriella. We reluctantly leave New York now because ultimately this was not your final destination. We dedicated quite a lot of time in our presentation because we are here. Yes. And this is the neighborhood that you knew and that changed so much and so on. But you had other plans. Your America was something different, even if you were fascinated with Manhattan, the club scene, the music, mm -hmm. and all that we heard. And one of your original fascinations, one of, of the big part of your American myth, were Native Americans. And you know that we were Geronimo, and she was crazy horse at a certain <laughs> little, point. Little horse, little crazy horse. And then she changed from little and crazy, I think. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and so, so that was part of your upbringing, of this yeah. myth that you cultivated, you and your family, you and your sister and your brother. Even watching like cowboy and Indian films, where normally the Indians were presented as the, the bad, bad people. Guys. What happened in your family that you uh, <laughs> really rooted for the Indians? Always. What so caused that? The Indians that? were our heroes because they were uh, defending their land. So um, when I was little, my name was Geronimo, you know. Um, and when I finally uh, was able to make it to the reservation, it was like the dream come true. I was galloping with the Navajo in India down, you know, to, down the canyon. And um, I lived there, um, I rented a trailer for $15 a week. <laughs> and the uh, young Navajo kids, I had a 16 millimeter camera because I always, you know, wanted to film. And, um, and uh, I explored the reservation. Um, uh, and there wasn't, uh, actually at the end it was pretty sad because um, I ended up being arrested uh, in Gallup, New Mexico, just because I was with an Indian boy. Um, they threw him in jail. It was during a, uh, um, a oh, well. uh, and see, uh, an, an Indian celebration. Um, every August they have uh, be, uh, all sorts of celebration in Gallup. Um, and the Indians get drunk and, and, they, uh, and they throw them in jail. Uh, my friend that didn't do anything. We were crossing the street to get some Kentucky Fried Chicken. So, and the cops came and uh, grabbed him and, uh, and threw him into their uh, car. So I followed them because I wanted to know what happened, why, and they arrested me as well. So um, I f found out that the experience um, being an Indian, I wanted to become an Indian, but then, you know, I realized that I'm not. And <laughs> and moved to California. And what took you to California was cinema. We know that uh, while in New York, you studied cinema here yeah. at, at NYU, and that came in handy. But tell us your approach to cinema. The first time, it was not a very lucky uh, moment, but it started a, a new period in your life. Francis Ford Coppola casting you and Alessandra for a part as two mm -hmm. Sicilian girls for which film? The Godfather uh, 2. It was an amazing experience. And, and then how come you're not in the film? <laughs> Tell us the story. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm still you in the film, but in as a crew. nurse. And, 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 okay. <laughs> we were um, about to shoot a scene uh, where um, the mafia guy, Gastone, played by the great Moschine. actor Gastone Moschin, um, uh, uh, gets killed by Robert De Niro. It was De, uh, uh, Vito Corleone first uh, murder, first killing. And the scene was supposed to be shot in a small apartment in Little Italy. So um, we were all dressed up, uh, beautiful costume. It was like, but I was still, I was, in the meantime, I was also working as an assistant with walkie talkie on the set. So I changed, put up this clothes, 
uh, with my sister who was really excited about this, it was like a couple, a godfather too. And then we already, we on the set, we're ready to shoot, and then Coppola looks around with his uh, Gordon Willis, the director of photography, uh, Dean Tabolares, the um, production designer. He looks at this place and said, this is too small, I can't shoot the scene here, uh, let's go. So we were like, what? You mean, no, no <laughs> shooting? <laughs> <laughs> so, no scene, no shoot. That I went back and took my walkie-talkie and went back to the set. And my, my sister was, was really upset. <laughs> she went to the producer and said, what do you mean I'm not in the mood? <laughs> she got fist. Because yeah. she wanted to be in front of the camera, yeah. whereas you had I made your yeah, choice. I made my choice. You I like to, to be behind, behind, the, behind camera. the camera. Tell us about your, your life in Los Angeles, in the world of cinema there. What was it like? What was, again, a dream of yours to be yeah. making movies? Right. And, and you were making movies for a while. Well, How I was didn't it? make my movie because, you know, uh, luck plays a lot. In yeah. this business, it's a tough business. Uh, but I got to work with people like Oliver Stone, whom I knew uh, as a friend, um, Coppola, of course. Um, and uh, I lived uh, in, in L.A. from 74 to 2001. Uh, and but in the 70s and 80s, there were the best uh, American movies were made, were being made. So I, m I met a lot of those people and hang out with them, got crazy with them. <laughs> uh, it was gr it was great. It was a really be part of um, this amazing um, reality of cinema. Uh, a lot of great movies. I I got to work with Ber Bert Schneider, the producer of Easy Rider. Uh, last picture show, um, and uh, the film I was involved in was uh, Days of Heaven, with the directed by Terence Malick. Mm. So, um, yeah, I didn't make my movie yet. I didn't Bravo. give up. Yet, it's the key word. <laughs> 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 and yeah. Gabriele, and one question that that comes is, why did you back to it? Did you go back to Italy? Uh, the uh, the reason was that uh, first of all, I learned how to be sort of flexible in life, follow my sentiero, my path, where it's taking me. Um, my mother um, had lost uh, her sight. And uh, in 30 years, I didn't get to see this woman very much. So a little bit was I wanted to try Europe uh, and see, see what happens and be close to my mother, and, um, and then she passed, but I spent a uh, few years, few years uh, b close to her, and was worth it. So then you never know, I might come back, you know, who knows? <laughs> and as you mentioned, um, you said you have not made your film yet. Yeah, but I have a trailer. But we have a trailer. <laughs> So that yet is very important because <laughs> we all hope that you will be able to make it. So before we open up to questions from the public, I would say that we oh, uh, look yeah. at your trailer and, okay. then, and then we come back. Later. All right, okay. lovely. Um, because my the question is, how did you get to study at NYU Film School? Yeah, um, I didn't finish the school. I didn't graduate because I ran out of uh, the lady I was the lady I was staying with. The Jewish family uh, helped me out, so yeah, she was, uh, and then she also helped me out with uh, the new school. I took um, intensive English every day because I spoke English, but I couldn't understand New Yorkers. <laughs> it's a funny story. At the beginning of the book. Why don't you tell uh, us? Okay, I um, I wasn't during my depression, um, so I used to go and eat alone, um, smoking a cigar, you know, um, in, in in Italian in, in Roman trattoria. Um, that evening, uh, there was a I was there, and there was this lady with a six-year-old boy. Um, who didn't want to eat uh, uh, spaghetti carbonara. <laughs> and <laughs> that's what they had. He didn't like it, he didn't know it. He kept saying, I want spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> 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 and she kept telling him, what, but carbonara is good, it's made good. So I was listening to this conversation, this poor kid, you know, he was kicking the table, I don't want spaghetti carbonara, I want spaghetti and meatballs. 
So I told the waiter, do you have spaghetti? Yes. Do you have meatballs? Yes, put them together and give the kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, the, and then I started talking to the lady and I, I opened up to her and, and she said, um, I, I love your country, but as a woman, it's really bad, <laughs> very backwards. Uh, we, we um, in America, we are having a real revolution, the first feminists, and she was a feminist, even though she had a, a family. Um, and she said, I'm not rich as an American standard, but you can stay in my house. Uh, let me know when you're ready. Um, and so when I decided, I wrote a letter, she called me, she said, I'll pick you up. Uh, and that's how I, I came to to New York. She and I lived with with her and their family. She had a brown stone building on Ninth Street. I couldn't believe it. How lucky I, I was <laughs> just for spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> 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 Always be kind to strangers. <laughs> yes, sir. Is the mic on? Well, the main things that you learned from him. Actually, uh, he taught at NYU, but not, yeah, I didn't uh, study with him. Oh. I, he taught at NYU. He was, a, I think, an editor. He taught editing. But I didn't, I wasn't, you know, studying with him. I didn't study with him. So. But, Gabriele, in the book also you tell about an encounter that you had with another great director, uh, Rossellini, that as you know, uh, is related to Scorsese, actually. Yeah, Isabella I Rossellini always really says, uh, Martin married me, but he was in love with my father. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand, so I was in love with Roberto. Tell us about Rossellini um, and, and what he told you. Um, he told well, Ros uh, Rossellini um, uh, was a mentor for me. Um, I think I, um, he uh, transmitted this passion for film that I have, uh, I will always have. And he, I spent a, f a few months, a couple of months with him and his family and the crew uh, scouting location in Tunisia for a project he was doing um, for Italian television, I think. He said, come, come with me, I show you uh, cinema, I show you what it is to make a movie. And uh, he was like, you know, a, a fabulous figure for me, a mentor. And when he, he used to come to New York, I always saw him, went to visit him. Uh, I mean, so, that, yeah, <laughs> thanks to him. Can I say that? Yes. Thanks to my sir, I met Roberto Rossellini my first week or something like that in New York City and hung out with them for a whole week. So that's became my mentor, and thanks to you for many other things. <laughs> <laughs> Grazie, Thank Alessandra. You, sister. Yes. Hi, I'd just like to say I really love the book. Alessandra told me about it, and I read it. Um, and as an American, somebody who grew up in the United States and took all of these things for granted, all the freedoms mm -hmm. growing up in the 70s, it just really struck me. And your tone was so beautiful, I just felt like you know I was sitting having a cup of coffee with you. And your honesty and your candor it was I really enjoy it. It's available on Amazon as an ebook. Thank so you. Everyone should get oh. it. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Eilish. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I've had the pleasure of studying with your sister for the past three years and Hearing your story, one of the things that has really struck me is a parallel between your two work, which is the way in which you have this tremendous compassion for outcasts and for people who are on the fringes of society. Um, and so I'm wondering, given what you've said about the environment that you were raised in and the patriarchal culture that you've come from, where do you think that came from? Um. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, for me, it's probably the the um, the, uh, the the not the myth. I mean, the underdog. <laughs> I, um, for example, I saw uh, uh, a movie um, 
a midnight cowboy, okay, that had a lot of humanity in it. Uh, and I said, I want to live in that place. I want to meet that, uh, what it is, what, what this, you know, what it is, what city, what, um, how people live in a city like this. And the, um, I was always attracted to the, the underdog or the outcast because I found that um, I could learn probably uh, a lot. Um, uh, maybe, you know, it was just my fantasy. <laughs> um, but it was part of also my curiosity for life. Because these people, when I was here, the Bowery was not the Bowery that it is now. And I used to just walk there and talk to these bums and these people that ended up like that, because it can happen to all, all of us. Um, and it was compassion, I think. That's the word, probably. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Gabriele, thank you very much for sharing your story. And my question follows up a little bit to what uh, she asked. And it has to do with the uh, trauma that you had. And uh, we don't need to go on into that. Uh, I couple that with what's happened in the past couple of weeks with the whole uh, Kavanaugh um, uh, testimony. And mm -hmm. uh, I came out of that a couple of days of listening intensely to what went on, hoping that um, that event would bring about a change in our attitude, society's attitude towards uh, these tragic events that, that women suffer. Um, unfortunately, I feel that that did not happen. Um, and I'm having conversations with both male friends and female friends. And one of the things that comes out is that uh, people that have gone through such an experience are so traumatized mm -hmm. that they're unable to, to deal with it in a positive way to bring some closure. I don't know your story, but it sounded like you were able to come out of that um, in a fairly short amount of time where it did not have an impact uh, on your life. And I wanted to know what was it uh, in you uh, that made that happen and that might help uh, other women uh, to um, go through that as well. Thank you for asking this question and this time, of, uh, we're, this moment that we're going through um, what just happened with this woman and Kavanaugh, I, it was horrible that he made it actually. Um, I, um, I think for me, it was, um, I had to survive. There was no uh, other choice. I, would, I didn't want this incident to ruin the rest of my life and be a victim twice. Uh, so I said, no, fuck him. I, uh, I made it, I'm alive. And it, I was, uh, yeah, I went through paranoia, uh, heavy paranoia. I was alone, um, and I discovered that uh, we are always alone because the moment you need somebody, the phone doesn't work, the answering machine is off. <laughs> and and, um, and I, I dealt with it, and I, I grew the woman I am because uh, it takes courage, you know, and you have to be really strong and learn how um, what you can do with your life. So yes, it wasn't. I didn't allow uh, this incident to ruin my life, and it didn't last that long. So that's probably why <laughs> I no, had to thank survive. You. That's a, that was a key question because, that, of course, that's a, uh, a key point in in your life. There is a before and after that moment. Even yeah, if and you I had to go to a job interview. You know, I couldn't miss that. So I told him, whatever you, you want to do, do it quickly. So we did it quickly and then left. But, um, <laughs> but I went to a job and, interview. And Gabriela, the interesting thing is that what you say about the, the, the job interview when you delivered the, the photographs, and there is the, the person to whom you delivered this, the important journalist, basically there is a molestation. He touches yeah. you and basically makes you understand that if you behave in a certain... So, and it, it feels in the book that you're even more insulted by that than yes. by, the, yeah. by the, the act of the rape because yeah. it's... And it says a lot about you know, what mm. you had to go through in, in your right. yeah. uh, existence, <laughs> like going from one thing to the other. The, the same day. The same day. And he tried to touch me. He said, oh, you know, what happened to you? And I told him, I got robbed. Oh, you're so lucky! You and I started touching me. So nothing else happened, and I just went to get the fuck out of, you know, <laughs> away from me. 
but I had to sell those pictures. Um, it, it, then it, it didn't obviously it didn't do anything. Yeah, it was Italian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Is that Cristina? Cristina Fontanelli, thank you. I don't even know if I need this. Alessandra, I came because I, I respect your sister and love her so much. I said, I have to meet her sister. So, and you're so talented. And um, I just have a question for you because you have an amazing background, amazing talented writer. As far as the film, you were around incredible film directors and talents. What would need to happen to have your film made into a motion picture? Did you approach them? You know, what, what is the link that never sort of, what has to happen? Um, well, um, a, a lot of it is luck um, and being able also to be uh, submissive as a woman when I was working uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, if I wanted to be part of Coppola's clan, probably I could have. But I would have, um, there was, I, when I was working with Coppola, I have to say this, and it's not in the, in the book, because it has a lot to do with the Me Too movement. Um, I saw it as working with Coppola, that was my chance of getting to know a master and all the people that work with him. So um, I was uh, helping uh, Gordon Willis, the cinematographer. This is an added thought, with, but it has to do with probably the reason why I haven't, you know, made my movie yet. <laughs> um, and I, we, we went to Sicily, we were supposed to shoot scenes in Sicily, and I was riding in a limo with, the, with a producer and Gordon Willis. Uh, when we got to the hotel, it was m in the middle of the night, and I was told that I didn't have a room. I was supposed to uh, share the room with Gordon. And I went, what do you mean? I, no, I want my own room, I'm working. And they said, what do you mean, no? Um, you are staying with Gordon. And I said, no. And they just left, and I checked in across the street at the pensione. The next day, nobody would talk to me. Um, wow. And it was like, oh my god, what's happening? Uh, and Francis came to me and said, Gabriella, you are making a revolution on my set which means that a lot of other girls didn't say no. Wow. So I said, you know, Francis, it was great. Uh, I loved the experience, but adios. I packed my bags and left. No way. <laughs> I choose who I want to fuck, you know. <laughs> Can I, <laughs> may I ask a, a well, further? But, you know. But did uh, you ever think maybe now that this is all coming out, you could actually get some Publicity. Now I'm trying very seriously uh, through get the people I know, through, the, through the, the people that I've met through the years to make this movie happen, yeah. But what about the story about Coppola? Would you feel comfortable s telling that story? Yeah. You know yeah I mean? Gordon is dead. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you know, it, he, when he told me you're making a revolution, I went, wow, am I, I'm making a revolution? Because I said no. Whoa. You know, so I left. Um, and you know that that means, uh, as an example, uh, the being with the clan. Also, with Oliver Stone, he didn't he never made a pass on me. We were really good friends, but he had all sorts of submissive women around him, the ones who bring coffee, who say, "Yes, Oliver. Yes, Francis." <laughs> I'm not like that. I can't change that. <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely don't. You know. Do we have time for one more question. <laughs> That's okay. I wonder how you see yourself now at, at this point in your life, having experienced these two um, cultures, having overcome the difficulties of both. How do you see yourself now? Are you an American? Are you an internationalist? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, my heart is here. I'm an American. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I came here, I was so young. I learned a lot. I developed who I am because of America. And um, I learned also that my, I'm, you know, my background, I'm proud that I come from, from Italy. And, and 
Um, there's a lot of good stuff, but it's a country that doesn't move. You know, the wheel doesn't turn. Uh, and uh, why the people, everybody asks me, why did you come back? And I said, uh uh, this is an optical illusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you don't come back from 30 years of America. There is no coming back. So I'm, I love this country, even now with all the, but I know it will go away. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Mattia, and um, Mattia. I, am, <laughs> I am an Italian guy. I have just uh, one question for you. Uh, what means to mm, live in the USA for the first time, and what means for Italian young guy to stay here? Um. I can repeat if you want. <laughs> Um, cosa, cosa significa per eh. un, un giovane ragazzo italiano che si trasferisce qui per la prima volta? Che, che esperienza deve aspettarsi? Um, Dici adesso, in questo momento. Sì, in questo momento. So yeah. uh, you asking me then. Sì. <laughs> uh, well, I think um, it, it's, uh, it's a great uh, privilege to be able to be here as a young person and um, uh, it depends on what, uh, what, you know, what this person is made of. You can certainly have a lot of opportunities here, um, but you have to be humble, uh, be able to wait, you know, be patient. Um, if you do the right thing, maybe the, your time will come, but you're better off here, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, before we, we close this evening, I just want to say that uh, when the lady asked the question about what is about you and, and your sister feeling for the, you know, the outcast uh, of society, and, and I think the key word that you said compassion. was compassion. compassion. And it's a word that we don't use enough because it was used instrumentally by politicians, yeah. and it doesn't mean to feel pity or to no, feel no, no, no. sorry for somebody. The real root of the word is from Greek, and it means to feel with the other person, to feel with the other. And I think that's what your book reveals about you, is mm -hmm. that your ability to feel the same feelings of the person you're with. And it's a great sign of generosity. That's a good word. And dignity. Yeah. And I think uh, we should all be grateful for you for having told your story so honestly and so brilliantly. And we wish you all the best that this book becomes the film that you have in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we, c we couldn't close without Alessandra. No, because what, what she just said, the compassion and the outcast, I feel like we have to thank our mother for that, mm -hmm. because I thank her everywhere I go, because she was a true example right? she of uh, acceptance of everyone, super compassion. In New York in the 70s, we took her to gay clubs, and she was part of the gay movement without really knowing it, but she was in it. <laughs> and she never judged anyone. She followed her heart and accepted everyone. I think we really got it from her, You're right. for sure. So the last applause is for her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>